Anastasia, and the Russian Revolution. The 20th century brought many changes to traditional cultures around the world. Some of the most radical changes occurred in the Russian Empire, which had one of the oldest monarchies in Europe. In 1917-18, the rule of the czars was replaced by the world's first communist government, led by Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. No one was more affected by these changes than Anastasia, the czar's youngest daughter. Between 1895 and 1901, Tsar Nicholas II and his wife Alexandra became the parents of four beautiful and healthy daughters: Olga, Tatiana, Marie, and Anastasia. However, since a girl could not inherit the throne of Russia, it was important for Alexandra to give birth to a son. Finally, in 1904, the Tsar and Tsarina had a son, Alexei. This event, which should have made the whole family very happy, proved to be a source of great sorrow. Alexei was soon found to have an incurable disease. This disease, hemophilia, meant that Alexei regularly suffered from uncontrollable internal and external bleeding, which left him very weak. This caused anxiety for all the family, especially his mother and father. The Tsar and Tsarina loved their children. The girls, who didn't have to worry about becoming rulers, led a fairly carefree existence. Anastasia and her sisters lived in a palace with hundreds of servants. They attended many society parties with their parents. The most elaborate parties were grand balls, where everyone dressed in their finest clothes and danced all through the night. The absolute rule of the Tsar was not popular with everybody. The majority of the population was poor peasant farmers who could barely keep themselves and their families alive. If they moved into the city to get jobs in the factories, they had to work long hours for very low wages and live in slum conditions. Popular opposition forced the Tsar in 1905 to give up some of his power to an elected parliament. None of the girls married; they all lived a happy life together. They moved from palace to palace, attended by their private tutors, visiting the beach and sailing on the royal yacht. Anastasia was the clown of the family. She didn't like schoolwork, but she enjoyed painting and photography. Many of her photos of the royal family in happy times survive. Soon, the czar's problems worsened. The Empress Alexandra worried about her son and became ill. War with Germany broke out in 1914, and the Russians suffered many defeats and losses. In March 1917, there was a popular revolution, and the Tsar was deposed. From that time on, the royal family were prisoners. At first, they were treated kindly, but in November, the Bolsheviks or communists gained control of the revolution. Lenin and his followers hated the Tsar. The royal family had been living in Tobolsk in Siberia because of fears that they might escape. They were brought back to Ekaterinburg in the Ural region. Here, after midnight on June nineteenth, nineteen eighteen, the entire royal family was shot by the Bolsheviks. To some, this news was too dreadful to be believed. The thought that the Tsar's lively and beautiful daughters had been killed was too hard to bear. Within a couple of years, a woman who went by the name of Anna Anderson appeared in Western Europe. She claimed to be Anastasia. Some believed her story, and some did not. With the fall of the Soviet Union, it was possible to investigate the murder of the royal family. It was also possible to prove that Anna Anderson was not the real Anastasia. After a long search, the bodies of Anastasia and Alexei were found. They had died with the rest of the family. A great mystery was finally solved. Casa Loma. Many people visit Europe and see the old castles left from the days of knighthood. Very few return home with plans to build their own castle. Toronto businessman Henry Pellet actually built such a castle, Casa Loma. Pellet was born in Kingston, Ontario, in 1859, but the family soon moved to Toronto. His father opened Toronto's first stock brokerage firm in 1866. Pellet Sr. became part of Toronto's financial elite, and Henry Pellet eventually joined his father in business. The young Pellet was especially attracted by the military and the British armed forces. When Henry was 18, he joined the Queen's Own Rifles, a militia unit. He was soon one of the soldiers sent to suppress a railway strike. 
At 21, he was made an officer and gradually moved up through the ranks, eventually becoming a brigadier general. Meanwhile, Henry was learning the stock brokerage business. He soon showed considerable ability at forming new companies. Electricity was a recent invention, and Pellet hoped to be among the foremost developers. In 1883, he founded the Toronto Electric Light Company, and later was an owner of the Toronto Electric Railway. He also made money as a land speculator in the Canadian West. Unlike many businessmen of the time, however, Pellet believed in community service. He sponsored many charitable organizations and supported various good causes. In spite of his business dealings, Pellet found time to tour England and Europe regularly. He brought back ideas for a castle on the hill. Pellet's castle, however, would not be a damp, drafty castle of the Middle Ages. It would have the latest technology. Construction of Castle Loma began in 1910 and was completed in 1914. Outwardly, it looked like a medieval castle, but inside, it was comfortable and luxurious. There were 98 rooms, three bowling alleys, 30 bathrooms, 25 fireplaces, and 5,000 electric lights. It had an electric elevator and an indoor swimming pool. There was a library of 100,000 books. A temperature-controlled wine cellar, a shooting gallery, and a large art collection. Pellet ordered only the most expensive materials and employed the best craftsmen. The cost of all of this was three point five million dollars—a huge sum in those days. Pellet and his wife liked to entertain. They often opened up Casa Loma for special events. Sometimes he would invite all one thousand men from the Queen's Own Rifles over for the weekend. The Pellets also held parties for the staff. Pellet had hoped that Casa Loma would be the center of an extensive subdivision. He hoped that wealthy people would build grand homes nearby, and so he bought up the land near his castle. Unfortunately for Pellet, most of the people coming to Toronto were poor immigrants who couldn't afford large houses. Pellet was unable to sell his land holdings, and his income declined. In 1924, Pellet turned Casa Loma over to the City of Toronto because he could not pay his property tax. All the contents of Casa Loma went on auction soon after. His 1.5 million dollar collection of art and artifacts sold for only two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Now Casa Loma is a leading Toronto tourist attraction. The castle in the middle of the city has four hundred thousand visitors each year. It is the closest thing in North America. To a real European castle. Conquering Lake Ontario. In 490 BC, the Greek runner Philippides ran the 24 miles from Marathon to Athens to announce the Athenian victory. His endurance was so much admired that runners ever since have attempted to run similar long marathon distances. In the 20th century, however, long-distance swimming has also attracted attention and admiration. To swim the English Channel or Juan de Fuca Strait between Vancouver Island and the mainland have become challenges for both male and female swimmers. In September 1954, some Canadian businessmen from Toronto offered veteran Californian champion Florence Chadwick ten thousand dollars if she could swim Lake Ontario. They felt sure that such a feat would attract large crowds. Chadwick had swum the English Channel in both directions. However, no one, neither man nor woman, had crossed Lake Ontario. It was a 32-mile swim through cold water and difficult currents. Two other women also decided to take up the challenge. One, Winnie Roach Lausler, had also swum the English Channel. The other was a 16-year-old girl named Marilyn Bell. The swimmers traveled to the mouth of the Niagara River on the south side of Lake Ontario. They would swim from Youngstown in the USA back to Toronto. Bad weather delayed the swim for several days. During the night of September 8th, the weather cleared and the swimmers entered the water before midnight. Guided by her coach's flashlight, Marilyn swam through the dark water and soon passed Chadwick, who was lifted from the water after swimming 12 miles. Lausler made it further, but she too eventually had to give up. Marilyn not only had to overcome her fears of the dark, but she was attacked during the night by blood-sucking lamprey eels. She was able to knock these off with her fist. As dawn approached, the winds and waves increased, and Marilyn's weariness mounted. Her coach, Gus Ryder, passed her some corn syrup on a stick, and later gave her liniment for her tired legs. He wrote messages on a blackboard to encourage her to keep going. Sometimes he tricked her into thinking that she was nearer to the shore than she was. 
Marilyn fell asleep in the water twice and had to be awakened. The second time, a friend of hers jumped into the water beside her and swam with her for a distance. Because Marilyn's strength was declining, she was being pushed off course by the currents. Although the direct route was 32 miles, Marilyn swam a total of 45 miles. The last few miles were extremely difficult. Marilyn's family and the lifeguards felt that she should be taken out of the water, but her coach threatened to quit as her coach if the swimmer gave up. It was getting dark again, and the swimmer was barely conscious as she approached the shore. Thousands of people lined the shore, hoping to touch her or get a picture of her. Marilyn's supporters had to push the crowds back so they wouldn't stop her from touching the shore. Finally, after 21 hours in the water, Marilyn reached land. The exhausted girl was rushed to an ambulance. She had lost about 20 pounds of her 120 pounds weight in the crossing. Finally, she was able to sleep. Huge crowds came out to see her the next day, and two days later, there was a parade in her honor through the streets of Toronto. Everyone admired the courage and endurance of the 16-year-old girl who became the first person to swim across Lake Ontario. Death Valley, California The steep mountains of southeastern California dip suddenly into a deep valley. Rain is kept out of the valley by the high mountains which form its western slopes. Although mountains surround the valley, Death Valley itself is very low. In fact, its lowest point is 282 feet below sea level, the lowest point of land in North or South America. Death Valley is about 140 miles long, but only a few miles wide. It got its name in 1849 during the California Gold Rush. Gold seekers attempted to cross Death Valley on the way to California's gold fields, and some died of thirst there. There's hardly any water in the valley. The average rainfall is only a couple of inches a year. It is also one of the hottest places in North America in the summer. Temperatures of 134 Fahrenheit have been recorded. As a result of this heat and dryness, Death Valley is a desert. These conditions give rise to the valley's most important products, mineral salts and salt deposits. One of these products is borax, which has many industrial uses. Borax was removed from the desert using 20 mule teams hitched in a long string. Later, a railway was built to help carry out these minerals. In spite of its desert conditions, Death Valley has considerable animal and plant life. Of course, its animals and plants are those typical in desert conditions. Only on the salt flats do plants refuse to grow. With even a small rainfall in the spring, the desert will come alive with wild flowers. Very few places in the world have such a contrast in heights and depths. The mountains near the valley are among the highest in continental USA, while the valley itself is the lowest elevation. Mount Whitney, at 14,495 feet, is less than 100 miles from Death Valley. The climate in the valley from October to May is generally pleasant. Since Death Valley is now a national park, many tourists visit during this season. Now roads and hotels provide comfortable access. Death Valley is located close to the Nevada border. Its desert conditions are common throughout the area of the American West, just east of the coastal mountains. In most cases, heavy rain falls along the coast, but very little in the interior. Because there is no farming and water is hard to obtain, Death Valley and similar desert areas have very few permanent residents. Ebenezer Scrooge in the story A Christmas Carol, Scrooge is an English businessman who thinks about nothing but money. He has no friends and spends no time with his family. He lives alone, eats alone, and works alone, except for his underpaid clerk, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge never spends his money, but hoards it all and prides himself on his frugality. Scrooge hates Christmas. It's all nonsense to him. People spend money on food and gifts and parties. Often they can't afford what they spend. Worse than that, they take a whole day off work, and so lose a chance to make more money. Scrooge is angry that he has to give his clerk the day off with pay. He feels that he's being robbed. Christmas is also a time when people are asked to give money to help the poor. Scrooge is angry when two men come to his door asking for donations. Scrooge argues that he pays taxes, which support prisons and workhouses. It is not his business to worry about the problems of other people. Scrooge represents businessmen who see the bottom line as all that matters. Scrooge's partner Marley had died seven years earlier. He was like Scrooge in all respects. That evening, which is Christmas Eve, Scrooge is visited by Marley's ghost. 
Marley drags steel chains round about him, which contain keys, cash boxes, ledgers, purses, and deeds. These are the things that Marley cared about when he was alive. Marley is condemned in death to wander the world and tells Scrooge that the same fate is likely to happen to him. However, three spirits will visit Scrooge, and if Scrooge listens to them, he may escape this fate. The first spirit comes and takes Scrooge back to the early scenes of his own life. He sees himself being left behind at school while the other boys went home for the holidays. Then his little sister arrives to tell him he could go home too. Another scene was of a cheerful Christmas party when Scrooge was a young man. A third scene showed him with the girl he was planning to marry. She left him because he no longer cared about anything but money. The second spirit shows Scrooge what people are doing that very Christmas. He shows Scrooge the preparations that people, even poor people, are making to celebrate Christmas. They visit Bob Cratchit's tiny home. There, they see the family cooking their little Christmas dinner. Bob's son, Tiny Tim, has been weakened by disease and has to use a crutch to walk. The family is delighted with its meal, small as it is. They see other scenes of poor people, miners and sailors, celebrating Christmas. Finally, they visit Scrooge's nephew and view his Christmas party and its games. The third spirit was the spirit of Christmas yet to come, the future. This spirit does not talk, but points to scenes connected with Scrooge. They overhear some businessmen joking about someone who has recently died. Scrooge sees that he no longer occupies his usual place of business. The spirit then shows him two women who have stolen the bedclothes, curtains, and clothes off the dead man and taken them to a pawnbroker. The spirit takes Scrooge to the room where the dead man died. The only people who are happy about the death are a young couple who owed him money. The spirit then shows Scrooge the Cratchit's house, where they're mourning the death of Tiny Tim. Finally, the spirit takes him to a churchyard, where they stand among the graves. Then the spirit points to the name of the dead man on the tombstone, Ebenezer Scrooge. Scrooge is going to die, and no one will care. Scrooge finds himself in his own bed on Christmas morning. He is resolved now to avoid the fate that the spirits had shown him. He is delighted that he is getting a second chance. Scrooge decides to surprise all his acquaintances, and he begins by buying a huge goose and sending it to the Cratchits. On his walk, he meets the two men collecting for the poor and offers them a large sum of money. He goes on to join his nephew at a Christmas party. The next day, when Bob Cratchit comes into work, Scrooge gives him a raise in his salary. He also takes care of Tiny Tim so that Tim recovers his health. Charles Dickens' story was written at a time when governments did very little to help the poor. Wages were very low, and many businessmen were unwilling to look after their workers properly. Dickens points out that people like Scrooge not only make other people unhappy, but also are usually unhappy themselves. It is possible to be a very rich businessman and a poor human being at the same time. Gambling. Many governments have turned to legalized gambling as a way to increase revenues. Raising taxes has become very unpopular, and gambling can be seen as a cash cow. Large casinos are often considered good for areas with high unemployment. Most new casinos include a variety of slot machines, table games such as blackjack and roulette wheels. Opponents of gambling point to problems associated with it. Crime rates go up, especially with respect to theft and prostitution. People become addicted to gambling and play until they are broke. Stress is put on families when one member gambles, and the grocery and rent money are spent. On the other hand, many people view gambling as an exciting form of entertainment. They look forward to the opportunity to play the lottery or go to the casino. Often, they feel that they are getting good value in terms of entertainment for what they spend. The truth is probably that some people can control the urge to gamble, while some cannot. People who find gambling really exciting feel that they have to go back for that high, even if it means spending all their money. Many people doubt that governments should promote gambling, since it is certain to produce addicts. There has also been some question whether gambling is good for the local economy. If a casino is built in an area of high unemployment, will local people really benefit? The answer seems to be both yes and no. People may benefit if the gamblers come in large numbers from outside the area and spend their money there. That is, if the casino is a notable tourist attraction. On the other hand, if not many people come from outside the area, there are few benefits. In this case, most of the gamblers are local people 
who are spending the little money they have. Gambling is especially attractive to older and retired people. Since older people don't have much chance of making a lot of new money, the thought of winning the jackpot is very attractive to them. Casinos regularly run buses from retirement homes so that seniors can come and gamble. Some would see this as taking advantage of lonely people. There are stories in the newspaper about couples leaving their children locked in the car for six or eight hours while they gamble. One man hoped to improve his finances by gambling, but he lost heavily. His wife found out and went gambling herself, hoping to win some of the money back. Before long, they had to sell their house to pay their gambling debts. Gambling has usually been associated with organized crime. Even today, when government agencies supervise gambling, it would appear that there is still a crime connection. This may be because many of the best gamblers and gambling administrators learn their trade outside of the law. Besides this, gambling establishments attract various forms of crime to the area. Since law and government have an important educational function, one doesn't like to see them involved in gambling. Government should be more than profit maximizers. They should be concerned chiefly with the public good. Hawaii, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, far from any land, there are the Hawaiian Islands. These islands are the tops of a chain of volcanic mountains. Two volcanoes on the island of Hawaii are still active. There are five larger islands: Kauai is to the west, Oahu, Molokai, and Maui are in the middle, and Hawaii is to the east. There are three smaller islands. Hawaii is the largest island of the group, but Oahu has the largest population. The capital city Honolulu is on Oahu. Since the Hawaiian Islands are so far from any land, one might wonder how people arrived there. The answer is that the first Hawaiians were very good sailors. They traveled thousands of miles from other islands in the Pacific in canoes. To keep these canoes stable in the ocean, they attached an outrigger or pontoon to the main canoe. Sometimes they fastened two canoes together and put a wooden platform on top. Then they could carry lots of people and supplies. The first Hawaiians were Polynesians and probably came from the Marquesas and Tahiti in the South Pacific. They were a tall, good-looking people. Their kings made rules about how their people should live, and priests and advisers called kahunas enforced these. Today, the phrase "the big kahuna" means someone who is or thinks he is very important. Although Hawaii lies within the tropics, it has a very mild climate. Sea breezes keep the weather from getting too hot, even in the summer. Many edible plants grow in abundance there, so it was not difficult for the Hawaiians to live very comfortably without working hard. Captain Cook was the first European to reach Hawaii in 1778. Soon, European and American ships visited there regularly. The sailors also brought diseases formerly unknown. By 1853, the population had dropped to 73,000 from about 300,000 when Cook visited in 1778. Besides Europeans, people from China, Japan, and the Philippines came to live there. Soon, large plantations of sugarcane and pineapples developed. As more and more land came under Western control, the native monarchy was undermined. American plantation owners were able to arrange for United States control of the islands. Today, the largest industry is tourism. Since the climate is good all year round, visitors can come at any time. When you arrive, a young Hawaiian woman will greet you. She will put a beautiful flower necklace called a lei around your neck. Hula dancers entertain tourists. Hula dancers wear skirts made of long leaves. Each dancer tells a story by moving their arms and hands in a certain way. For meals, the Hawaiians like to dig a pit in the ground. Place wood in the pit, and then set the wood on fire. Food wrapped in leaves is then placed on the wood, and the pit is covered with leaves and mats. A feast cooked this way is called a luau. These traditions nowadays are usually performed for tourists or on special holidays. Hawaii is the 50th state of the United States, and its people enjoy all the advantages of the modern world. It could be a whole lot better. As I was sitting in the reading room at the library, a man got up and left, commenting, "It could be a whole lot better." I wasn't sure whether he was referring to the reading room, the world he was reading about, or something else. 
I replied without thinking, "That's always true and always false." What I meant was that it was always possible to make little changes to improve things, but it isn't clear ahead of time that these changes will make a big overall improvement in a library, in the world, or in anything else. Years ago, literary critics used to examine great writers very closely to find bad phrasing or ungrammatical sentences. They'd look at a play by Shakespeare and identify lines that they didn't think were very good. Sometimes they would suggest that these lines were added by another writer, or that Shakespeare had written this part quickly without much consideration. Sometimes they would omit or improve on the lines. It is doubtful that any of Shakespeare's plays were actually improved by these critics. An entire play needs high points and low points, poetry and prose. The whole thing is greater than its individual parts, and changing a couple of these parts may not improve the whole thing. It is the same in many other areas: music, athletics, scholarship, and probably everyday living. It's not always the singer or musician who is flawless that we admire most. Sometimes it is the person whose performance is not perfect, but who puts a special energy, feeling, or enthusiasm into their work that we admire. It is true that little things can sometimes add up to a big difference. Changing a bad habit can make a difference in your life and in the lives of the people around you. Giving up smoking, for example, or ceasing to criticize a family member, can make an important difference. Sometimes, however, we are only looking at the symptoms of a larger problem. For example, nearly everyone would agree that giving up smoking is a good idea. But if our smoking is related to emotional problems or stress in our lives, then giving up smoking may make us feel even worse. It may be necessary to deal with the root problem. It can happen too that being always on the lookout for ways to improve things may become a problem in itself. Perfectionism means never being satisfied with things as they are, especially if we're always criticizing people around us for not being good enough. This can become a bad thing. A popular saying in North America is, "If it ain't broke, don't fix it." This is a warning to people who feel that their role or position involves making continuous changes in policies, procedures, products. Or personnel. Sometimes the drive for change can be more of a personality problem than a genuine concern to make things better. Real problems are often clearly apparent. Problems like world hunger, personality conflicts, policies that don't work, poor levels of service, bad manners, and all kinds of troubles are hard to ignore. They are also difficult to resolve. Perhaps that's one reason why some people identify things as problems, which are of concern to hardly anyone except themselves. Yes, we can make the world and the reading room better, but we can also make them worse. It takes a lot of discernment and usually some experience to know how to make a particular thing better. There are so many things that could use improvement that it is difficult to know where to start. This too requires some thought, not to mention prayer and study. We can start by asking whether the thing we see as a problem is also a problem for other people. If it isn't, then maybe our energy and attention might be better employed elsewhere. Las Vegas, Nevada. Nevada is a large state of deserts and mountains. Since most of the land is not suitable for farming, the population grew very slowly. In the 1950s, there were only 267,000 people in the entire state. Now there are nearly a million people living in the Las Vegas area alone. Las Vegas has become a major tourist center. It used to be quite a little desert town of the old west, but in the 1950s and 1960s, hotels and gambling casinos were opened. In order to bring tourists to town, these hotels hired well-known entertainers. Soon, Las Vegas became known as a major entertainment center. In order to promote the growth of Nevada, some activities were allowed which were against the law in other states. These included gambling and prostitution. It was also easier to get married in Nevada than in some other states. Over time, many other attractions were developed. Much of the activity in Las Vegas goes on at some 30 major hotels. Many of these hotels provide a complete range of services and entertainment. Some of them boast 4,000 or 5,000 rooms. It is common for these large hotels to be organized around a particular theme, such as the Middle Ages, the Arabian Nights, the movies, the circus, Paris, Egypt, or the Far East. 
The hotel, its restaurants, shops, lounges, and entertainment reflect this theme. For example, the Paris Las Vegas Hotel has a 50-story replica of the Eiffel Tower. The Luxor Hotel has a huge image of an Egyptian sphinx and a replica of the tomb of King Tut. Nearly all of the major hotels also contain a casino, sometimes several casinos. Gambling is a major reason why people come to Las Vegas. There are slot machines, blackjack tables, and roulette wheels, and much more. Even though Las Vegas is in the desert, there is an extravagant use of water. Large swimming pools, water slides, artificial waterfalls, and huge fountains are common. Health spas, beauty salons, fashion boutiques, specialty restaurants, and malls abound. Tennis and golf are also popular. The lavish shows at Las Vegas are world famous. Tall dancing showgirls, like the famous Rockettes, wear beautiful but rather skimpy costumes. Some entertainers, like singer Wayne Newton, rarely leave Las Vegas. The pay there is good, and the audiences are appreciative. Near Las Vegas are other tourist sites, such as the giant Hoover Dam. Behind the Hoover Dam is the large artificial lake, Lake Mead. Further up the river is the Grand Canyon. All these things are a short trip from the city. Las Vegas is called the city that never sleeps. At nearly any time of the day or night, there are casinos and shows that are open. A monorail connects many of the leading hotels. Many people view Las Vegas as a total entertainment package. One word of caution: set yourself a limit on how much you will spend at the casinos. Gambling can be addictive. Little House on the Prairie. Much of the history of North America is about how Europeans moved westward from the Atlantic coast towards the Pacific. The first settlements began around 1600, and it was a long time before the Europeans settled the interior. By the late 18th century, however, good farmland along the east coast was becoming scarce. As the population increased, people began thinking about all the native Indian lands further inland. Families were quite large in pioneer days, and the oldest son usually inherited the family farm. This meant that other sons and daughters would have to move away when their parents died. Often, the sons would want to begin their own farm and start their own family. But if there was no farmland available, or if it was too expensive to buy, they were out of luck. One option was to move west, where land was free or very cheap. Sometimes the whole family might move if their old farm was no longer productive. Sometimes the old farm was on poor soil, or too much farming had exhausted the soil. Perhaps better land could be had further west. There were other reasons for moving west. Pioneer settlers depended on wild birds, fish, and wild animals for food, furs, and skins for clothing and trading, and trees for building materials. These things had become scarce in old settled areas. Out west, there were lots of animals to hunt for food, and animal skins could be traded for supplies. It seemed that it was easier to make a living on the frontier. Of course, there were some problems regarding moving west. Various American Indian tribes who might fight to defend their land occupied the land. Then the land needed to be cleared of trees and stumps before it could be planted. A log cabin and other buildings had to be built. A well had to be dug, or a spring of water found. Settlers might also suffer because there were no doctors or teachers or stores available. These things, though, often did follow closely behind the first settlers. A series of little house books, written by Laura Ingalls Wilder, tells the story of her pioneer family. The Ingalls family moved many times while Laura was a little girl. She was born in Wisconsin in 1867. Her family moved next year to Missouri. Then they moved to Kansas in 1869. The Ingalls moved back to Wisconsin in 1871. They moved to Minnesota in 1874. Her family went to Iowa in 1876, then back to Minnesota in 1877. Finally, they moved to Desmit, South Dakota, in 1879, and there the family remained.
All these moves were typical for a pioneer family, always on the lookout for better land and other opportunities. But all these moves involved very hard work, all of which seemed all lost when the family had to move again. For example, when Laura's parents moved to the Kansas Prairie in 1869, they had many hardships. The family put all their belongings in a covered wagon, which measured four feet by ten feet. Two horses pulled it, and the family dog followed along. Laura and her sister Mary were very little girls. The family and their wagon were nearly washed away trying to cross a small river. They traveled through wild, tall grass where there were no roads. Laura's father built a house on the open prairie with logs he had hauled from the creek bottoms. One of the nearby settlers helped him. They also built a log stable for the horses. That was a good thing because the next night their little house was surrounded by a pack of fifty large wolves. They formed a large circle around the house and howled all night. One day, while Laura's father was away, two Indians visited the house. They wanted Laura's mother to feed them and stood silent while the food was cooking. The Indians wore only fresh skunk skins as clothing. After the Indians had eaten all the food, they left. The following spring, there was a large gathering of Indian tribes. Most of them wanted to fight the settlers. For many nights, the sounds of Indian drums frightened the settlers. One tribe opposed the plan, and finally the gathering broke up, and the Indians went away. Many other problems faced the Ingalls family. These included bad weather, prairie grass fires, and malaria. The worst part was having to leave their new homes. The government decided that Laura's family was living on Indian land and would have to move. So the covered wagon was packed again, and the family traveled north. Such experiences were not unusual for pioneers in the 19th century. North America's rainforest. When people think of rainforests, they usually think of the tropical jungle. But heavy rain can also produce dense forests in temperate areas. Along the northwest coast of North America, there are some of the largest trees in the world. This forest runs along the Pacific coast from Alaska down to Northern California. About half of it is in British Columbia, Canada. Several species of trees grow to an immense size. Some grow up to 95 meters, 312 feet high, and 12 meters, 40 feet in circumference. They may be as much as 1,000 years old. Because the trees are so tall, the forest has various levels of growth. Small plants attach themselves to the tall trees and may form a kind of garden in the air. Further down are the tops of the younger trees. Closer to the ground are shrubs and bushes. Along the ground are moss, ferns, berries, and other plants. These old forests have developed over several thousand years. The tall trees are at least several hundred years old. This old forest has several special features. Some of the dead tall trees remain standing and become homes for insects, birds, and small animals. Trees that fall to the ground can become nurse logs for new plants or trees to grow on. Trees that fall across rivers and streams can provide natural dams, which provide quiet water for animals to live in. In recent years, it has become common for logging companies to clear cut this old forest. To clear cut a forest means to go into a section of forest with heavy machinery and cut down every tree. Sometimes these clear cuts are as large as some European countries. Logging companies are doing this because it is a cheap method of logging. The problem is that when an old forest is cut, it does not grow back again. Even with replanting, companies produce a tree farm, not an old forest. The complexity of an old forest, which grew over thousands of years, is lost forever. The old forest can shelter many kinds of birds, mammals, fish, and plants that a replanted forest cannot. Another issue is that companies are cutting more and more old forests because they haven't done enough replanting. As long as governments have been willing to let companies cut old forests, neither logging companies nor governments have been much motivated to replant the forests. As a result, most of the old forest has been cut down and continues to be cut at a rapid rate.
This situation has also worsened because new technology allows more rapid logging. Clear-cut logging results in erosion, which in turn damages the quality of rivers and streams. This causes a decline in the salmon fishery. Animals like grizzly bears, elk, and deer are harmed by the loss of habitat. Likewise, birds that nest in the old forest, such as bald eagles, owls, woodpeckers, and various seabirds, are being threatened. Recently, public interest in the old rainforests has resulted in an increase in tourism. People come to see these spectacular trees and the many plants and animals that depend on them. We hope that these unique temperate rainforests will remain for many more generations to enjoy. Prince Edward Island. Throughout history, people have dreamed about a special place. Remote from the day-to-day -day business world, sometimes they have thought of this place as an enchanted world where the weather is always good and the food is always easy to get. Sometimes it has been a hidden valley in the mountains or an island far out to sea. When the Europeans arrived in the South Pacific, they thought that they had found it. Islands such as Tahiti seemed about as perfect as possible. Nowadays, our cities grow larger and larger, and people have to work harder and harder to succeed. Many people would like to escape to a quieter, slower, more peaceful, more attractive environment. When summer holidays come, many people travel to Prince Edward Island in eastern Canada. It has a mild summer climate and hardly ever gets too hot or dry. The fields, trees, and crops stay green all summer. In fact, PEI is famous for the many shades of green on the island. Its soil and dirt roads are red because of iron oxide in the soil, and visitors are never far away from the blue waters of the Gulf of Saint Lawrence. In late June and early July, the roadsides are covered with large purple flowers called lupins. The vivid colors of PEI help make the province a photographer's paradise. Prince Edward Island is almost 100 miles long and about 20 miles wide. It is small enough that a tourist can see much of the island in a couple of days. But there are enough interesting things to see and do that most people like to stay longer. One of the chief traditional occupations is fishing. At one time, fishing was an important source of food and income for many islanders. Now the fisheries are in decline. Boat owners find it more profitable to take tourists out to fish than to fish themselves. Lobsters and shellfish are still important to the island, which is famous for its lobster suppers. Tourists can visit many picturesque little fishing villages all around the coastline. Farming is also important. PEI is famous for its potatoes, which are exported all over the world. Dairy farming is also common, and local ice cream is popular with tourists. Apple orchards, grain fields, hay fields, and vegetable gardening are also widely found. During the era of sailing ships, a lot of shipbuilding took place on the island. But as steel hulls replaced wooden hulls, shipbuilding moved to regions where steel was being produced. The full impact of the Industrial Revolution has never hit PEI. Farming, fishing, and tourism have remained the chief industries. There are no large cities on the island, so if young people want to go to the big city, they have to leave PEI. The majority of island people prefer to live in small towns and villages, just as their ancestors did. Since there wasn't much industry on the island, many people did not have a lot of money. As a result, they may do with their old houses, old furniture, and old ways of doing things. This is why visitors to PEI sometimes feel like they are going back in time. Things on the island seem like they are still the way things were in our parents' or grandparents' day. Most of the people who live on the island are descended from British immigrants in the 18th or 19th centuries. The majority of these were from Scotland, and the Scottish heritage remains strong. There are also some Mi'kmaq Indians and some French Canadians or Acadians. The island has generally avoided social and political strife, and this contributes to the peaceful atmosphere. Islanders welcome people from away as tourists. However, some say that to be a true islander, you have to be born on the island. Nonetheless, some tourists have fallen in love with PEI and have gone there to live. A couple of years ago, a bridge was built to connect the island with the mainland. Many opposed this fixed link, saying that it would destroy the special PEI atmosphere. 
It remains to be seen whether the island will change now that tourists can drive directly onto the rich red soil. Red-haired Anne. The story of Anne Shirley, the red-headed orphan, has been popular around the world for almost a century. The opening chapters of Anne of Green Gables tell how a brother and sister, living together on a farm, have decided to adopt a boy. Matthew Cuthbert is now sixty years old and needs help working the farm. They have sent away to the orphanage, and the boy will be arriving by train. When Matthew goes to the train station with his horse and buggy, there is no boy, only a girl, Anne Shirley. Anne is no ordinary girl. She has a vivid imagination and loves to talk about things that interest her. Matthew, who is shy and quiet, takes an immediate liking to her. When they arrive home, however, his sister Marilla is very upset. She doesn't see what good a girl would be to them. Matthew says. We might be some good to her. After a while, Marilla begins to feel sorry for the thin little orphan and decides to keep her. But Marilla finds that teaching Anne how to behave properly is quite a challenge. Anne often does things without thinking first, and Marilla has to be vigilant to keep her out of trouble. As time goes by, Anne becomes accepted in the community and doesn't get into as many difficulties. One characteristic of the little orphan is a love of big words. While she lived a life of hard work, Anne liked to imagine beautiful things that she didn't have. This was her way of dealing with unhappiness when she worked as a servant for unkind people. Living at Green Gables makes her happy, but she doesn't lose her love of special words or beautiful things. Anne is also unhappy because she has red hair and freckles. In Anne's day, beautiful women were thought to have light, clear complexions and black hair. Her coloring seemed unromantic. However, red hair and freckles are very common on Prince Edward Island, where many of the people are of Scottish descent. This story tells us a lot about how to be happy. When Matthew and Marilla stop worrying about needing a boy and start taking care of Anne, they find that they enjoy having her around. Their lives become much more interesting now that they have someone who needs them. So happiness involves looking after others and being needed by them. There are many stories about orphans when Anne of Green Gables was written. Before modern medicine, many parents died before their children were grown up. A lot of mothers died in childbirth. Since fathers didn't usually try to raise young children in those days, someone else had to take the responsibility. This is what happened to Lucy Maud Montgomery, the author of Anne. Her mother died when she was a baby, and her father left her with her mother's parents. Montgomery's grandparents provided a good home for her, but they were very strict and stern, and didn't have a lot of sympathy with the little girl. In her story, Montgomery is imagining how she would have liked her own life to have happened. What if her grandparents had been more like Matthew and Marilla? What if they had allowed her to do more of the things she wanted to do? Wouldn't she have been happier then? The story shows how young children are hurt by bad treatment from the adults looking after them. Even if the adults don't mean to be unkind, sometimes they say or do things that make children very unhappy. Anne teaches parents and grandparents to encourage their children and help them to be happy and successful. Anne Shirley is one little person who changes a whole community and makes it better. We all have special gifts and talents, and if we are allowed to use those abilities, they will benefit everyone around us. Shopping at the mall. At one time in North America, most people shopped downtown on Main Street. Most businesses were at the center of town. When people started using automobiles, however, they moved away from downtown. In time, most people lived in the suburbs. Eventually, stores and small shopping plazas were built in suburban areas. Still, most of the big stores were downtown. But as more and more cars were on the roads, driving and parking downtown became a problem. There wasn't room for a lot of cars to park downtown. People also didn't want to fight downtown traffic just to go shopping. So, in the 1950s and 1960s, there was the beginning of large suburban shopping malls and plazas. Plazas were a row of stores attached to one another. Malls were usually a double row of stores with a roof connecting both rows. 
This means that shoppers did all their shopping inside. Large department stores and grocery stores were usually part of the mall, but there were many smaller stores as well. When you came to the mall and went inside, many people would get a shopping cart. You can walk along the aisles, putting your purchases in the cart. When you're finished shopping, you can push your shopping buggy out to the car. Many malls also have buggies or strollers for pushing small children along. There can be a lot of walking in a trip to the mall. In fact, some people go to the mall just to exercise. A half dozen laps around the mall every morning amount to a pretty good workout. However, there are always places to sit down when you get tired. Most malls have a food court. This is an open area with a lot of tables and chairs. Usually, there are a dozen or more small restaurants circled around the food court. The department stores often have full-size restaurants. Malls have large parking lots. Unlike downtown, you don't pay to park at the mall. On a busy day, finding a space close to the store can be a challenge. Many people go to the malls when the weather is bad. During wintry weather, the malls are busy. Likewise, in really hot summer weather, people go to the malls to get cool. The climate there is always the same. People don't go to malls just to shop. They also go to meet people. Usually, you bump into friends and neighbors there. Old people, as well as teenagers, go there to see friends. Usually, the malls sponsor special events. With lots to see and do, malls are a popular place to hang out. Sunday morning at church. Every Sunday is a holiday or half holiday in North America. Some stores may be open, but banks, offices, and government services are usually closed. Sunday closing has a Christian origin. Christians believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead on a Sunday morning, so Sunday is known as the Lord's Day. About 30 or 35 percent of North Americans attend church regularly on Sunday mornings. About the same percentage attend church occasionally. At Christmas and Easter, the churches are very full as people celebrate these two important holy days. Nearly everybody goes to church at least three times. They are baptized or dedicated as a child. Most people are married in a church, and many people are buried after a church service. Church services are usually held Sunday mornings, often at 11 o'clock a.m. Although there may also be evening services provided, most services last an hour. Their purpose is to worship God and to help people focus on religious and moral beliefs. The service is led by a pastor, minister, or priest, who usually also looks after the people and the business of the church. It is the pastor who delivers the sermon, a twenty-minute talk on a religious or moral matter. Usually, members take part in the service. They may lead the singing, read from the Bible, offer prayers for the congregation, take up the collection, or act as ushers. Most churches also have a choir, a group of singers who lead in singing the hymns. There are many cultural traditions connected to going to church. People normally wear their best clothing and try to be on their best behavior. Talking or making noise in church is usually considered bad. This is why children often have a separate children's church or Sunday school, where they can be more like children. The Sunday service is the main weekly event in many churches, but nowadays there are a growing number of large super churches which organize all kinds of activities for their members. These churches usually have large buildings and a large staff to plan and lead various activities. These might include prayer group, counseling and social work. Youth programs, social action, fundraising events, etc. Many large churches have gymnasiums for regular sports activities. At the same time, house churches are also becoming very popular. These are small groups of people who meet at private homes. Sometimes a group will meet in a house until they have the money to buy a church. But many people say they prefer to meet in small groups. That way, they get to know one another better. Then they feel comfortable sharing their problems and successes and praying for each other. Some say that large churches can interfere with getting close to God and other Christians. There are many different brands of Christianity. The largest single denomination in North America is Roman Catholicism. One large Christian brands are Episcopalian, Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, Lutheran, and Presbyterian. All have slightly different traditions and beliefs. Although in the past these groups have often been in conflict with one another, today they usually cooperate in working together for their members and the community. The Calgary Stampede. The Wild West, as we know it from Hollywood westerns, did not last a long time. Its height was from about 1865 to 1885, for only 20 years. By 1885, there were railways across the plains. Fences had been built around farms and ranches, and lawmen were on the lookout for any troublemakers. 
Not only that, but by 1885, nearly all the buffalo had been killed, and most of the Indians were on reservations. Still, the Wild West had captured the imagination of the reading public. A former buffalo hunter and Indian scout, Buffalo Bill Cody, decided to take advantage of his fame as a cowboy. In 1883, he organized Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show and toured North America and Europe. Alberta, Canada, had been the last part of the Old West to be settled. But by 1912, ranching was being replaced by farming. The city of Calgary was itself becoming a commercial and industrial center. Old timers looked back fondly to the old days of cowboys and Indians. In 1908, the Miller Brothers' Wild West show visited Calgary. One of the cowboys, Guy Wiedek, talked to local businessmen about putting on a rodeo and the Wild West show. Eventually, four Calgary businessmen put up twenty-five thousand dollars each to finance the event. Wiedek was a good organizer. He advertised all over the U.S. and the Canadian West for cowboys and rodeo riders to come. And with twenty-five thousand dollars in prize money, people came from as far away as Mexico. Wiedek was able to persuade the Canadian government to let large numbers of Indians leave their reservations to attend. In fact, the Indians were a big part of the program. The main rodeo events were bronco riding, bareback riding, women's bronco riding, steer roping, and bulldogging. These events were based on things that working cowboys actually did. But to make them harder, special bucking horses were brought in. One horse named Cyclone had never been ridden long by anyone. He had thrown 127 riders in a row. Most of the rodeo cowboys came from the United States, from Wyoming, Oregon, Oklahoma, Colorado, and Arizona. But there were also Canadian cowboys and some Canadian Indians competing. Queen Victoria's son, the Duke of Connaught, was the Grand Marshal. Many cowboys rode well, but no one could stay on Cyclone. On the sixth and final day, the grounds were muddy from rain, and the horses kept slipping. Cyclone escaped from his handlers and ran around the track. For his last bronco riding contest, Cyclone's rider would be Tom Three Persons. Three Persons was a blood Indian from Southern Alberta. When Three Persons got on Cyclone, the horse would rear up and plunge its head down to throw the rider. Cyclone acted as though it would topple over backwards, but Three Persons hung on. Then it hurled itself forward with its head almost touching the ground. After a wild ride of several minutes, Cyclone began to tire. The judges declared Tom Three Persons the winner of the Bucking Bronco event. Three Persons was the only Canadian to win a major event at that first Calgary Stampede in 1912. Today, the Calgary Stampede continues to be the largest rodeo and Wild West show in North America. It has many new events and attractions, and still attracts the best rodeo riders from all over North America. The Florida Everglades. Southern Florida stretches south, dividing the Atlantic Ocean from the Gulf of Mexico. Stretching further south is the Florida Keys. These coral islands are the southernmost part of the United States. Since much of southern Florida is close to sea level, it's very swampy. The famous Everglades are wetlands where tall grass and bunches of trees grow. Part of these swamps has been drained for agricultural land. The soil is rich, and market gardening is an important activity. The Everglades that remain are too wet to be used for farming. The Everglades are a river of grass. The deeper water areas stay wet all year, but the shallower pools dry up in the dry season. Some of the water has been drained off for agricultural purposes, making the Everglades drier. Nonetheless, the best way to travel in this region is by airboats. These high boats can go through water and sail over clumps of grass. Besides the wet grasslands, southern Florida has smaller areas of tropical forest. These areas of hardwood trees are called hammocks, and they are rich in animal and plant life. Along much of the coast are mangrove trees, which provide important nesting grounds for wild birds. The Florida Keys stretch 200 miles from Miami southwest. These islands are tropical in climate. Fishing and tourism are important industries. Because of its subtropical nature, the animal and plant life of southern Florida differs from other parts of the United States. Characteristic animals are alligators and crocodiles. Alligators prefer fresh water and usually live inland, while crocodiles live in salt water along the coast. Both animals are considered dangerous. Alligator wrestling is considered a sport for the brave or foolhardy. Probably Florida is the most famous for its birds. At one time, many species were almost extinct. Their long feathers were used on women's hats. Now the law protects them. Florida has at least six species of herons, several egrets, wood storks, white ibises, and cormorants. Characteristic Florida birds are the purple gallinule, the anninga, the limpkin, flamingos, 
and roseate spoonbills. Many of these birds are notable for their size, coloring, and interesting habits. Notable animals include the key deer, a miniature form of the white-tailed deer. There are also panthers or cougars, bobcats, marsh rabbits, mangrove squirrels, round-tailed muskrats, and the manatee. Naturally, the Everglades are home to many reptiles. Snakes are common, both water snakes and land species. There are four poisonous varieties. Both land and sea turtles abound, and lizards are fairly common. Fishing is a major industry. Sports fishermen go to sea in search of trophies such as marlin, sailfish, and tarpon. Smaller fish are caught commercially. Freshwater sport fish include bass and gar. After many decades of work to protect the animals and plants of the Everglades, the region finally became a national park in 1947. It is the third largest park in the USA and covers one and a half million acres. Within the park live 300 kinds of birds, 30 kinds of mammals, 65 kinds of reptiles and amphibians, and nearly 1,000 species of flowering plants. Of course, it is a major tourist attraction. The internet. The first working computers in the 1950s and 1960s were large mainframe machines. In some ways, they were like large calculating machines. The U.S. government, the military, and businesses and institutions used them for specific tasks. For example, they might be used to handle the payroll. As more uses were found for computers, the need to transfer data from one computer to another became a concern. In 1969, the U.S. government sponsored a program to explore ways for computers to transfer data over telephone lines. The first internet was created with four computers linked together. Of course, computer use increased beyond anyone's expectations. Standards were developed that describe how data was to be transferred between computers. A common language for commands and communications emerged. Operating programs such as MS DOS, Unix, Macintosh, and Windows came into existence. The internet quickly expanded beyond government and military uses. The PC became the standard form of computer. Private agencies acted as hosts for internet usage. Around 1982, there were 213 hosts. By 1986, there were 2,300. Today, there are millions. The role of computers expanded so quickly that the USSR, which had discouraged computer use, found itself left behind by the USA. Part of the reason for the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989 was that they had fallen too far behind the United States in high-tech areas to ever catch up. One of the most popular uses of the computer is electronic mail or email. You can send a letter by computer over the internet to anywhere in the world in seconds or less, and it doesn't cost anything extra. Now data can be transferred great distances almost instantaneously. Another major internet use is the World Wide Web. In the early days, all web pages were text only. In the 1990s, it became possible to make web pages interactive and multimedia. Interactive means that readers could click on items on the web page and get more information. They could also communicate directly with the web page owner. Multimedia means that web pages were no longer text only. They could also have graphics, film, video, and audio. This has helped to turn computers into popular entertainment. Nowadays, people spend hours every day surfing the net. However, there are some problems. For some people, computers are addictive. Many businesses are trying to control employees using the net during working hours. Since the internet includes just about every kind of information, not all of it is good. You can find directions on how to become a criminal or a terrorist. There are scam artists who want to cheat you out of money. There are also aggressive. Pornography salesmen, not to mention people who want to kill your computer with viruses. Since the internet is not closely regulated, it's up to individual users to follow computer etiquette. Parents need to supervise their children's use of the net. Although the internet has some disadvantages, many people see the net as one of the greatest invention of modern times. Alexander Graham Bell. The Victorian period was a time of many new inventions. Earlier discoveries, such as the steam engine, the screw propeller, the power of electricity, and the possibility of sending messages along a wire, were now applied to everyday life. Inventors such as Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla explored new methods for harnessing electric power. Some of the greatest discoveries were made by Alexander Graham Bell.
Bell was born in Scotland in 1847. Both his father and grandmother taught speech methods and worked with deaf and dumb children. Alexander was also interested in this work, especially as his mother was almost deaf. Alexander's two brothers died of tuberculosis, and he himself contracted the disease. So his parents decided to leave Scotland for a drier, healthier climate. They moved to Bradford, Ontario, Canada, and lived in a roomy, comfortable house overlooking the Grand River. Today, the Bell Homestead is an historical museum that attracts visitors from all over the world. At that time, Canada did not have a lot of business opportunities, so Alexander found a job teaching speech in Boston, USA. But he returned to Brantford every summer. In Boston, Bell married one of his deaf students. His father-in-law suggested that there were good business opportunities in inventing communication devices. Bell soon developed a method for sending more than one telegraph message at the same time. While working on improving the telegraph, Bell and his assistant Thomas Watson found a way to send the human voice over wires. On August tenth, eighteen seventy-six, Bell sent the first telephone message over wire strung between Brantford and Paris, Ontario, eight miles away. The telephone caused an international sensation, with government leaders asking to have one. But Bell didn't stop there. He worked on the recording properties of wax cylinders and other approaches to flat phonograph records. He also developed the photophone, which later led to the development of the motion picture soundtrack. Bell worked on these inventions at his laboratory in Washington, D.C., but he didn't like the hot, humid summer weather there. So Bell began looking for a new place to spend his summers. He decided to build a summer home in Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia. The island reminded Bell of his native Scotland. Now he had space during the summer to do experiments outside. He soon began to experiment with flying machines. Bell designed and tested huge kites, hoping to come up with a frame for a flying machine. Along with some enthusiastic friends, Bell also experimented with airplanes. On February twenty third, nineteen o nine, one of these planes flew through the air for half a mile. This was the first airplane flight in the British Empire. The Alexander Graham Bell Museum in Baddock, Nova Scotia, displays many of these inventions. Bell was also interested in making a faster boat. Since much of a boat stays under water, the water resistance slows the boat down. Bell thought that if you could raise the boat out of the water, it would go much faster. Working on Cape Breton Island, Bell and his friends developed the hydrofoil, a boat that would skim the surface of the water at high speeds. Hydrofoils are in use in many places today. Every time people use the telephone, listen to a recording, watch a movie or television, or ride on a hydrofoil, they owe a debt to that greatest. Inventor Alexander Graham Bell. Charlotte Church. Many years ago, a German opera impresario was asked why so many of his leading ladies were physically unattractive. He replied, "The ones who look like horses sing like nightingales, and vice versa." Certainly, a good voice doesn't always go with an attractive appearance, but in our day of media images, good looks seem very important. Charlotte Church recorded her first album when she was 12 years old. It was called "Voice of an Angel." Everyone agreed that the little girl has a very big voice, and they were delighted that Charlotte not only sounded like an angel, she also looked like one. Her sweet schoolgirl appearance and winning smile are part of her success. Charlotte Church was born in Cardiff, Wales, in February 1986. Music and singing are very important in Welsh culture, and all of Charlotte's family were musical. Although Wales is part of Great Britain, the Welsh people are very proud of their own language, history, and heritage. Now that Wales has its own parliament in Cardiff, Welsh culture is promoted even more strongly. Charlotte sings some of her songs in the Welsh language. Charlotte began singing along with the radio as an infant, and by the age of three, she could sing a number of popular songs. She began singing lessons when she was nine. Charlotte first appeared on television early in 1997. This led to a number of other TV and concert appearances. In 1998, she signed a contract with Sony to record five albums. Since Charlotte's first album appeared, she has spent a lot of time doing promotional tours. Since she's a schoolgirl, her two tutors travel along with her. Voice of an Angel was recorded in five days in Cardiff, Wales. All the songs were ones that Charlotte already knew and liked. These included Pie Jesus, The Lord's Prayer, Jerusalem, and Danny Boy. The album came out on November nine, nineteen ninety eight, and within a couple of weeks was number four on the popular music charts. She recorded her second album, Charlotte Church, in nineteen ninety nine. 
Traveling involves doing showcases for people in the music industry and the media. This is to encourage people to promote your music. Charlotte also appeared on various U.S. talk shows, including David Letterman and Jay Leno. She finds that she gets asked the same questions over and over again. Besides media celebrities, Charlotte has met many leading public figures. Since she is a Roman Catholic, Charlotte was especially excited to meet the Pope. This was after she'd been invited to sing at a Christmas concert at the Vatican. She was also asked to sing at Prince Charles' 50th birthday party in 1998. She saw the prince again in 1999 when she sang at the official opening of the Welsh National Assembly. Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip talked to her too. Later that year, she sang for Bill and Hillary Clinton at the Ford Theater in Washington. Something that people like about Charlotte Church is that when she hasn't been spoiled by fame, many show business kids are loud, brash, noisy, and rude. But when she is away from the stage, the young singer leads a normal life with her family and friends. Even when she is on TV, she comes across as an ordinary teenager, but a very nice one. Charlotte's voice always gets comments. It seems like such a big voice for a little girl. Very few teenagers have a powerful operatic voice like hers. Some people have found it hard to believe that it is actually Charlotte singing. For the most part, she enjoys her success. She likes to travel and meet new people. Los Angeles is her favorite city, and she likes the United States and Canada. But she is always glad to get home to Wales and be with her friends. At the moment, she goes to an all-girls school, so she doesn't see boys very often. But at age 15, an interest in boys is likely to become a factor in her life. Charlotte now has recorded three albums, and we can expect a fourth in 2001. She also has written an account of her life for all her fans. It is entitled "Voice of an Angel: My Life So Far." Garage sales and yard sales. Every Saturday morning in our part of the world, except in winter, many people drive around the city looking for yard sales. Yard sales or garage sales often take place in the driveway of someone's home or perhaps the front lawn. The homeowners take out all the stuff they don't want and arrange it in front of their house. Usually, they put a price tag on items. People driving by will stop to see if there's anything they want. Many people spend every Saturday morning shopping at yard sales. If they find that they have bought too many things, then they have a yard sale of their own. Some of the shoppers are dealers who buy things for resale. Sometimes they resell them at their own yard sales. But some dealers are professionals who run antique stores, used bookshops, flea markets, or used furniture and appliance stores. Usually, the dealers will try to get to the yard sale before anyone else. That way, they have the best selection. Often, they'll try to buy items for less than what the price tag says. The cheaper they can buy the item, the more profit they can make when they resell it. Their motto is "Buy low, sell high." Sometimes, a merchant will boast that he paid one dollar for a glass or china cup at a yard sale and sold it for a hundred dollars at his store or on the internet. By having catalogs that show the value of collectibles, dealers can sometimes make large profits. Now, however, many of the people having yard sales will try to check the value of the things they are selling first, so it is getting harder to get a real bargain. One reason for yard sales is that North Americans often live in big houses, which fill up with things. People may use the basement, the attic, the spare room, and the garage to store things that they aren't using. If they store things in their garage, all they have to do is open the garage door and have a garage sale. When children grow up and move away, the parents will often sell the children's old clothes, toys, and furniture. Another reason for yard sales is that there are a lot of things that people might like but don't want to pay full price for. For example, if someone likes to read novels, they may be happy to pay one dollar for a book at a yard sale rather than twenty or thirty dollars at a retail store. What sorts of things are sold at yard sales? Just about anything you might find in a house or yard. There are ornaments, china, home decorations, sports equipment, bicycles, games, dolls, toys, tables, and chairs, lamps, appliances, books, records, paintings, clothes, record players, and much, much more. Some items are things that were popular a few years ago, but now have gone out of fashion. This might include many toys, books, and games that relate to an old television show that is no longer being shown. While a lot of older people go to yard sales, so do a lot of students. Students and young people may need cheap furniture for their apartment or a bicycle to get to school or work. 
they may not be able to pay full price. If you are lucky, you can find almost anything at a yard sale. The trick is to get there early. Most yard sales are advertised to start at 9 a.m., but dealers may arrive as early as 7:30 a.m. By 10 a.m., the busiest part is already over. Although most yard sales go on into the afternoon, yard sales tend to prove the common saying that one person's trash is another person's treasure. Trial by jury. If you are a citizen of Canada or the United States, it is very likely that you will be summoned at some time for jury duty. A letter will come in the mail telling you to report to a certain place at a given time. There are legal penalties for not attending because jury duty is considered every citizen's responsibility. Often, a large number of people, perhaps several hundred, will be summoned at one time. When you arrive, you will join a lineup of others who are registering for duty. Eventually, you will get to a table and talk to an official. If you have a special reason for not being a juror, such as ill health, you may be excused at this point. Those not immediately exempted will become a part of a jury panel. Out of this panel, a number of juries of twelve people will be chosen. These will decide a variety of criminal cases over the next few weeks. What follows is the experience of one woman in a jury pool. She went ahead with others into a large courtroom where they spent the whole day. At the front of the courtroom were the judge and the lawyers for the prosecution and for the defense. One of the lawyers explained what the case was going to be about. The names of the jury panel were in a box at the front. When someone's name was called, they went up to the front of the courtroom. The person called up would then have a chance to explain why they couldn't serve as a juror if there was some reason preventing them. For example, one woman was dismissed because she knew the accused. The first jury to be chosen was for a burglary case. A panel member went forward and faced the accused. Then the lawyers in the trial decided whether the juror was satisfactory to them. At lunchtime, the panel was dismissed for an hour. The second jury was to try someone on a charge of murder. Usually, the panel was told approximately how long the trial might be. Since jurors are not usually paid, many would like to avoid being involved in a long trial. The woman was called forward and had to look the man accused of murder in the eye. This made her quite nervous. Judging by her expression, the two lawyers would decide whether they wanted her on the jury or not. The defense lawyer would try to choose someone who seemed sympathetic to the man accused. The prosecutor would prefer someone who was not sympathetic. The woman excused herself by saying she had a very young child to look after and no relatives to help. She was allowed to go home at the end of the day. Some people wonder whether it is fair for lawyers to dismiss jurors who may not be sympathetic in their cases. For example, defense lawyers may try to choose young people if they think these will be less severe to their clients. In the case above, the lawyers seem to prefer women to men. This means that a lot of people are dismissed from being jurors without a good reason. One principle of the jury system, however, is to protect the rights of the accused particularly well. One might say that the jury system is biased in favor of the defendant. This is why defense lawyers have an opportunity to dismiss people who they think will not be favorable to their clients. Furthermore, having twelve jurors gives the defense a good opportunity for a successful defense. If the defense attorney can raise a reasonable doubt about the guilt of his client in even one juror, then the accused has a chance of being released. This happened in the O.J. Simpson murder trial. There, even though there was strong evidence that Simpson committed the crime, the defense was able to insinuate some doubts among the jurors. Moreover, the defense lawyers may be able to appeal to the emotions of the jurors. Particularly if they can think of a way to gain sympathy for their client, for this reason, defense lawyers are more likely to choose trial by jury over trial by judge alone. A judge is less likely to be swayed by emotion than a jury, and a defense attorney may also prefer a criminal trial to a civil suit. In the latter case, the client does not have to be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, but will be found liable if the preponderance of evidence is against him or her. This is why O.J. Simpson was acquitted on criminal charges, but then found liable for damages in a civil suit. Business ethics. What do business and ethics have to do with each other? Business is about making profits. Ethics is about right and wrong. How are they connected? Well, business ethics is the study of right and wrong as applied to business actions. Some businessmen would say that there is no need for business ethics.
if we don't break the laws of the country, we have nothing to worry about. However, we can do many bad things without breaking laws. In some countries, it would be legal for a businessman to pollute the land, sea, and air, to confine his workers to barracks, and to hire children to work in factories. But these things may not be right. On the other hand, it may be illegal for a businessman to do some good things. For example, his society may expect him to treat people unequally and discriminate against some ethnic or religious groups. In order to know what is right or wrong, we need a moral rule. This rule does not come from business itself, but from ethics. So we need a statement of what we believe to be right. The American Declaration of Independence in 1776 states an ethical principle. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. The Declaration further tells us that all men have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Principles such as these can be used in American politics and law to decide whether an action is right or wrong. Many companies have their own ethical guidelines. IBM, for example, outlines its corporate ethics under headings such as tips, gifts, and entertainment, accurate reporting, fair competition, and not boasting. So each employee knows what to do or not to do in various situations. Ethical choices are made on three levels: individuals, by companies, and by societies, make them. An individual might choose whether or not to accept a bribe. A company might decide whether or not to bribe government officials. A government or society might decide whether or not to outlaw bribery. Similar principles of right and wrong might be used at all three levels. For example. It might be decided that bribery is simply wrong in all situations. On the other hand, it might be decided to view the situation case by case. In other words, there is a strong ethical stand and a more tentative ethical stand. The strong ethical stand applies when you have a basic moral principle, and apply it to all situations. For example, you might believe. That it was always wrong to let workers handle hazardous substances without any protection. The weaker stand would consider whether it is legal to do so. If it is legal to let workers handle dangerous materials, and this conforms to social expectations, then the weak ethical stand would say, "No problem. As long as the law is not broken and no one strenuously objects, then everything is okay." However, in ethics, there is a principle called the moral minimum. This principle means that you should never harm another person knowingly. The only exception would be to protect some other people or yourself. So, business ethics would say that the businessman who exposes his workers to hazardous chemicals is wrong. He is not practicing the moral minimum. Business ethics. What do business and ethics have to do with each other? Business is about making profits. Ethics is about right and wrong. How are they connected? Well, business ethics is the study of right and wrong as applied to business actions. Some businessmen would say that there is no need for business ethics. If we don't break the laws of the country, we have nothing to worry about. However, we can do many bad things without breaking laws. In some countries, it would be legal for a businessman to pollute the land, sea, and air, to confine his workers to barracks, and to hire children to work in factories. But these things may not be right. On the other hand, it may be illegal for a businessman to do some good things. For example, his society may expect him to treat people unequally and discriminate against some ethnic or religious groups. In order to know what is right or wrong, we need a moral rule. This rule does not come from business itself, but from ethics. So we need a statement of what we believe to be right. The American Declaration of Independence in 1776 states an ethical principle: We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. The Declaration further tells us that all men have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Principles such as these can be used in American politics and law to decide whether an action is right or wrong. Many companies have their own ethical guidelines. IBM, for example, 
outlines its corporate ethics under headings such as tips, gifts, and entertainment, accurate reporting, fair competition, and not boasting. So each employee knows what to do or not to do in various situations. Ethical choices are made on three levels. Individuals by companies and by societies make them. An individual might choose whether or not to accept a bribe. A company might decide whether or not to bribe government officials. A government or society might decide whether or not to outlaw bribery. Similar principles of right and wrong might be used at all three levels. For example, it might be decided that bribery is simply wrong in all situations. On the other hand, it might be decided to view the situation case by case. In other words, there is a strong ethical stand and a more tentative ethical stand. The strong ethical stand applies when you have a basic moral principle, and apply it to all situations. For example, you might believe that it was always wrong to let workers handle hazardous substances without any protection. The weaker stand would consider whether it is legal to do so. If it is legal to let workers handle dangerous materials, and this conforms to social expectations, then the weak ethical stand would say, "No problem. As long as the law is not broken and no one strenuously objects, then everything is okay." However, in ethics, there is a principle called the moral minimum. This principle means that you should never harm another person knowingly. The only exception would be to protect some other people or yourself. So, business ethics would say that the businessman who exposes his workers to hazardous chemicals is wrong. He is not practicing the moral minimum.